as directed by the Prime Minister, we have kept the language, we have drafted the language, drafted the bill in a language which is very straightforward, simple to understand, easy to understand. Some very innovative things that have been attempted in this bill are, first, the consent notice which comes from any of the applications, any of the platforms, will now have to be given in any one of the Schedule 8 languages of the Constitution. So that means the Indian languages will now be available to users for getting the consent notice. Second, we have attempted in the, in the, in the philosophy of women's empowerment that Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government works, we have attempted uh, to use the word she and her in the entire bill instead of he and him and his. So this is a innovative thing which has been attempted in the bill. Uh, third, we have made sure that all the principles of privacy which have been laid down by the Honorable Supreme Court in various judgments and basis the experience of various countries, we have included all the principles in a very neat and very nice way and simultaneously we have made sure that the startup innovation ecosystem which is a phenomenal ecosystem and the small businesses are not encumbered by a huge compliance burden. Instead of that, we have tried to create a digital by design compliance framework. The framework is all designed, the compliance framework is designed right from the beginning, ab initio, in a digital way, so that it becomes a simple, easily accessible way for, uh, for implementing the bill. The focus is on protecting the users from all kinds of online harms which can come and create a safe and transparent and trusted digital ecosystem because today India is a major digital economy powerhouse and our economy has a great input from the digital side. So keeping all those things in, things in mind, the bill has been drafted. Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and you're watching Easynomics. With me today, Cyril Shroff, the managing partner of Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. And you just heard the communications and IT minister, Mr. Ashwini Vaishnav, explaining the key and salient features of the draft Digital Data Protection Bill 2020-22. Three months ago, it was withdrawn. That was a bit of a shock, that withdrawal. But then the government came out and explained that a better draft law would be put up. And uh, in a departure from, uh, from years ago, this draft will now be available for public comments till the 17th of December. And the government is saying that they will try and push this law through into parliament within the winter session. Uh, we'll see whether that timeline is met. but. Uh, Mr. Shroff, who is one of India's foremost uh, legal brains, joins us on the show. Mr. Shroff, what are the key tenets of India's attempt to ensure data privacy for, uh, for 760 million active internet users, the population of many countries, including the United States and many other Western countries together? Uh, what are the key salient features according to you? So, uh, thanks, uh, Siddharth. Um, and uh, now that the bill has been reintroduced, uh, we can see what the government meant three months ago when they withdrew the sort of previous version. So, uh, just firstly, in terms of, you know, comparing and contrasting the new effort, uh, the, the earlier bill, which was very elaborate, was uh, fundamentally conceptually based on the GDP, the European GDPR, uh, which is one of the sort of leading international standards on this. Uh, we have this new version moves away significantly from that, whilst it keeps some of the key concepts. There have been a number of, uh, if I can call it tropicalizations that have been done for our, uh, for our situation, for our country. That is point number one. Point number two, I think what the new bill does is uh, significant simplification, which is a point which uh, the minister also was uh, was explaining. 
both in terms of the language and the concepts uh, as also in terms of the length the, the previous bill was over 100 pages long this is about 20 to give you a sense of uh, the proportion of uh, simplification there's a drafting note in the explanatory uh, provisions also that simple language has been used there are no provisos uh, you know things like that uh, there was a comment about the sort of gender in terms of it. so many many examples of uh, how this has been simplified so that uh, not just lawyers like me uh, understand it but also common citizens understand what this is all about so i would give um, uh, high marks to the government for for this effort now mm -hmm. when you go for a simplification and you sort of shrink the length of a legislation a little bit of the baby also gets thrown out with the bath water mm. and i feel that in the public consultation some of these things will get added uh, added back which is okay I, I still think the effort is a great one uh, and we but we will need to make sure that what finally gets enacted in parliament whether it's the winter session or the budget session will uh, will be uh, sharp enough because anything which is it may be simple but if it is ambiguous it will result in a lot of litigation and uh, ambiguity in terms of you know what do i need to do um, hopefully, so sim uh, hopefully yeah. ho hopefully the the ministers involved in the drafting and redrafting of this bill uh, will note your words uh, uh, both rajiv chandrasekhar and ashwini vaishnav apart from other officers of the government of india and you word some uh, use some very important words tropicalization simplification the length of the bill and the language all music to the air uh, yes. I, I want you to break it up at this stage uh, without getting into too many granular details what is the bill trying to seek to do will it prevent me as a user from sharing my data or does it ensure that whatever data I share is protected by the entity that gets it? I can start with Aadhaar and then the entire social media world where we have submitted our data not once, Mr. Shroff, but multiple times over without knowing what we are really doing with it. No, absolutely right. I think the latter is what I think is the intention. The story starts with the Putaswami judgment of the Supreme Court where the fact that privacy is a fundamental right, the concept was, was recognized. And all the attempts since then, uh, whether it is uh, the, uh, the Shri Krishna Committee report, uh, whether it is uh, the, um, uh, the previous versions of the legislation that were introduced and kind of withdrawn, all of them have fundamentally proceeded on the basis that data uh, protection of the data is uh, uh, is important it is a fundamental right and legislation is required in order to do that because it must have consequences so there are uh, there, there are rights and duties of the citizen or what they call the digital nagri uh, in the bill uh, and correspondingly there are obligations and penalties and um, you know serious consequences that follow on the data fiduciaries and there is a very wide variety of data fiduciaries almost every organization that is receiving data from somebody else will become a data fiduciary uh, there is going to be a fair amount of complexity also on say for example financial institutions which have data protection obligations under their uh, their uh, like uh, like banks will have rbi related obligations as well or ye isme bhi aayega uh, from um, under the PDP bill as well. So that's another, we'll talk about that nuance in terms of overlapping uh, uh, overlapping regime, but we're looking at it at a simplest form. Uh, this, uh, to answer your question, uh, there, there, uh, there is now a statutory obligation on the data recipient who's storing the data that you mentioned uh, to handle it in a particular manner to look after and protect that data. And if there are data breaches, uh, that they need to be reported to the authority, failing which there are very significant penalties. The penalties in this are very, very large. They go up to 500 crores. Mm. And there is an almost an itemized list of, if you do this, this is the consequence that follows. So uh, they, we, I think we are going to see um, uh, a strict enforcement regime around this, as must happen in every... Uh, uh, in every data protection measure.
Mr. Shaw, uh, you, you spoke about very significant penalties and would I be right in trying to simplify it by saying that if there are 750 odd million active internet users and uh, these fines which go up from uh, uh, up to almost 500 crore starting with uh, lower amounts, these all together can uh, add up to a very, very significant, uh, significant whammy for someone who is breaching data protection. In that sense, would you say that this law is more inclined towards penalties uh, of protection or does it encourage the entities who are responsible for collecting and storing the data to be careful from uh, stage one? I think all of the above, I think the compliance, firstly, there will be a significant investment in technology for making sure that uh, uh, the expectations of the new framework are maintained. Uh, organizations will have to sort of create a data protection infrastructure within themselves. Second, I think, uh, you know, once clear standards are set out and companies will have to make their own policies as well. So it's getting into from a kind of a no rules framework or kind of a common law framework into now a very regimented, uh, legally defined framework environment, which carries consequences. If, for example, there is a data breach or a significant data breach, there is a reporting obligation and there is, you know, there will have to be steps to mitigate it. Otherwise, you can get slammed for very sizable and the, the consequences will go up all the way to the board. Right. What will be my rights as a user or especially of platforms that are not uh, sort of legally based out of uh, India and are in foreign domains? So if that is a data localization related question, um, if that if I can interpret it that way, I think this uh, there is a significant difference in this bill. So in the previous version, uh, or in the previous thinking, there was a complex data localization regime that has been created. We don't talk about that now, but instead it's a new, it's an interesting uh, framework where it's a data cannot be exported. However, we have created an exception for what are called trusted jurisdictions. Uh, there will need to be a framework and criteria set out for what is the meaning of a trusted jurisdiction, uh, where there will be locally protected law. So therefore, the uh, I will allow data to move out from the country only into a trusted uh, jurisdiction framework. Uh, we'll, uh, there Mr. will Shaw, be a lot of discussion around who should be trusted. Okay, uh, that that was what I was coming to. Will this mean in any ways? And uh, we, you know, we are still doing an early reading of the draft. Perhaps uh, finer details will emerge, and we'll uh, reconnect with you at that stage. But will yes. this mean that as a user, my accessibility to any kind of platform, social media, interactional platform, transactional platform is going to be curbed by any of the provisions that are now proposed? I think that what will happen as a practical matter is that there will be a lot of consents that will need to be given. And uh, whether it is going to be granular consent or itemized mm -hmm. consent is a nuance that will have to develop. You might find going forward as this gets implemented that you might have to You'll probably get a drop down screen with 15 20 items and you'll have to tick all those boxes to give consent for use for this use for that as opposed to a kind of a more generic uh, a generic consent that could have been there so this aspect i think is going to have two outcomes one is it might create consent fatigue uh, and i think secondly i think it may um, uh, it, it may it may create a uh, almost a kind of environment in which, you know, why do I really need to mechanically gear, to tick all these boxes as well? So, in, a, in an era of uh, excessive itemized consent, you might land up with, uh, with, with consent fatigue. But that's the conceptual basis that it's essentially consent-based. It's consent-based. Uh, uh, Mr. Shroff, just a, a quick uh, couple of more points. I know you have uh, limited time with us today. Uh, one of the issues that I want you to reflect upon, which is uh, as an example, uh, for, for many years, the government of the day drove all Indian mobile phone users to undergo a detailed know your customer KYC verification. Yet on the other hand, 
a company that is not domiciled in India has collected hundreds of millions of uh, mobile phone numbers, even those who are not on that platform, the whole phone books of people have been uh, stolen and these are my words. Will this law in any way help uh, protect my data in retrospect or will it only be applicable in the future because I have given away my data. I have given it away to all the social media platforms. I may have given it to this caller identity platform. I may have given it uh, at hundreds of other places on the internet. Will anything be recovered in retrospect? So, I, uh, on a detailed reading, I'll be able to interpret as to what this does for past situations. But obviously, this legislation, once it comes into in the consent regime, this will be prospective. Okay. It cannot be retrospective is what I feel now. But I mean, let's see the fine print. Okay. One more quick point. You said uh, the baby uh, uh, being thrown out or parts of it at least <laughs> with the bath water. What were you alluding to? So, there could be, I mean, this is again initial reaction. I think, for example, there is no clear distinction between personal data, sensitive personal data. You know, in the earlier version, there were several kind of shades of personal data that were recognized. Those distinctions are not very clear in this at this point. My in one previous version of the bill, there was a transition period for two years. So okay. we don't know whether, you know, if the legislation, let's say, for example, were passed in the winter session, whether it will come into existence, uh, come into force on... 1st of April, 1st of January, or one year later, uh, not aware. So uh, I think the, some of these nuances and uh, details will uh, will emerge as we go along. But if you step back to the mother idea of, uh, of the government of simplification and making it common man friendly, uh, I think these are some of the initial sacrifices that uh, one has to accept. What will happen is uh, once it moves to the next stage of legislation, then you'll see rules and uh, you know notifications under under this, and all some of these questions will be clarified at that time. That's my, my very, guess. My very final question, and this has to do with uh, past experience where India, in some ways, has struggled to frame regulations uh, uh, that impact very powerful global entities, multinational corporations in the new tech digital. Uh, uh, and now soon to be metaverse world probably. What are the chances of this uh, set of proposals passing muster uh, and, and being acceptable to all those external players, sir? I think you'll get mixed reactions. I think you will get um, uh, one set of uh, sort of global businesses and multinationals who might find that this is the simplified version is good. And the others who might find that, uh, you know, the, with the nuance having been kind of missed, up, uh, missed out, that some of these things have actually become uh, very onerous. Uh, no clarity in terms of the different shades of, you know, what is sensitive personal information, how do I collect it, the, uh, what might be seen as an excessive uh, consent-based uh, regime as well, because that's all going to add to cost of compliance. So three, three, four ideas. I think the sovereign right of any nation to regulate its data, I think no, nobody can challenge that. We are probably the only major economy in the world who do not have a law on this as yet. So I think that's a tick. Second, uh, the fact that uh, uh, this is sort of finally happening instead of being the state of you know, ambiguousness uh, that has been there over the last few years. Now we are at least now we're moving to the next step. I think it's a positive. Uh, third, I think just in terms of you know, India asserting its position that my country, my 1.4 billion people, I decide how to regulate it, linked with the sovereignty idea, I think that will be accepted. I think there will be, uh, as I said, a mixed audience on uh, uh, on section of provisions which are acceptable or which are uh, seen as onerous, but that will be an ongoing conversation. And I expect that there will be a lot of representations which the government will receive and will have to carefully consider uh, as they take it to the next legislative stage. So I think mixed, uh, the uh, short answer to your long question is a mixed outcome. Mixed outcome, but we, we like you said, at least uh, a renewed effort is being made. And like you said, a law that has been tropicalized, a law that 
a proposed law which has been made simple and hopefully will mean that the world's only uh, remaining large major uh, soon to be one of the uh, largest uh, economies in the world is at present taking steps as far as data protection for its 1.2 billion citizens is concerned. Mr. Shroff, as always, thank you very much for your time. Uh, viewers, that was one of India's foremost legal brains decoding uh, at, at the first instance really the new data protection law. We'll be back with more. Uh, stay with us till then. Goodbye. Uh, on this very show, Ray Dalio, who you probably will know, was telling us last week that the wealth gap is one issue which bothers him more than most other economic issues today. Now, uh, do you, in your conversations with large corporations,